and get it. Say it's time, it's time. to let your light shine. All right, here we go. Yeah. Y'all clap with me. And there you go. It feels good, right? To be in the light. It feels good, right? To so let it shine bright. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Let me hear you. This little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, okay, okay, this little light of mine I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine All the time, let it shine Yeah, sing it with me It's time to let your light shine It's time to let your light shine It's time to let your light shine, you got it. Light shine. I said it's time, y'all My light, my shine, my aura, my glow You never see me like this before I know, but you got to know I didn't get this way alone Like E.T., I had the phone home I return to that one that loved me first Open my Bible and find life in every verse God gave me out of the sea before I was blind I'm not star face, but I know the world is mine But I'm not talking about material things Like Kobe and his five rings Cause you can have boardwalk and park place Money to blow and a phantom whip deep bass But private jets to fly you from here to there And still be the press of Britney and shave off your hair But know about her, but I look good with a favor I don't need MTV to let me know I got it Make this little light of mine I'm gon' let it shine, let me hear you. This little light of mine, I'm gon' let it shine. Okay, okay, this little light of mine, I'm gon' let it shine, let it shine all the time, let it shine. Yeah, sing it with me. It's time to let your light shine. Let me hear you. It's time to let your light shine. It's time to let your light shine. The world needs your light. It's time to let your light shine. Some of you that know me may be confused. Well, listen, this the guy that used to sing the blues, but then I couldn't see that I control my fate. Too surrounded by a world of hate. When I speak of hate, I'm not thinking of someone else. The time the greatest damage we do to ourselves. Ask God to take that depression from me. And like a caged bird, he set me free. From that day, I never felt the same. Kinda like Paul without the changed name. From the moment I added Christ at the equation, he affected my life. Could you see the radiation? Not talking ultraviolet, it's deeper than the skin. I'm talking x-rays, we're fixing what's within. I wanna live my life in every day in such a way that it affects the world. Yeah, I'm talking gamma rays. It's joy I feel. I can't explain. If you give him a chance, he won't feel the same. I don't mean try like a new food I drink. Don't hold nothing back in his love, he gotta sink. Kinda like a ride at the county fair So much better with your hands up in the air The trust is love, and love is trust Christ on the cross, try to so as such Let him change your heart and renew your mind Cause it's time to see, no longer be blind Life is more than things we hold in our hands If you wanna learn, he can teach you so you understand Won't be a new shirt or your hairdo But it will say there's something different about you You got an inner glow and an outward shine You can say you got this way because Christ is now time It's time to let your light shine Let me hear you It's time to let your light shine it's time to let your light shine It's time to let your light shine Amen, amen And uh, we've been studying through the Gospel of Luke to find out that answer Because it's the only question that really matters And uh, what you decide for dinner tonight honestly doesn't even matter and what, what does matter is you got to make a decision on Jesus Christ. He's the most important person to ever live 
All of time revolves around him. Everything is about him. All the scriptures point to him. All creation cries out to him. All creation was created by him. He's all that matters, and we need to figure out who he really is because it doesn't matter what even I say, or your grandma said, or your mom or your dad. We need to find out what God's word says. That's the kind of church we are. We study God's word. And so on that note, please do me a favor and open up a copy of God's word. Uh, to Luke chapter 14. This Bible's all over the place. You're not going to offend anybody if you're on your phone. Please open up a Bible app if you want. Uh, Pens in hand, notebooks in hand. I'm going to do my best. I'm losing my voice. Pray for me. I got another service tomorrow morning, so I'm going to try my best to get through it, God willing. But open up to Luke chapter 14. We're going to read here in a little bit chapter 14, verse 25 through 33. Uh, just to let you know, if you knew, we generally go through books of the Bible. Uh, I'm not creative enough, nor do I need to be, to come up with something to help God with his cause. He's done, he's done it just perfectly in, in his word. And so we just go through it a little bit at a time, and we find out what God has to say to us. So I just want to ask you this question. Does God have your attention? Yes. Your full attention? Okay, Awesome. I want to call my message tonight, uh, Christian Limbo. Christian Limbo. Um, You'll see why in a moment. I posted something on Facebook, I think yesterday it was, and um, I was feeling a little bit frustrated. I know none of you guys uh, voice your frustration on Facebook, but I did. And uh, I said this, I said that being a Christian means uh, do what he says, not just believe who he is. Right? That's a good place for an amen. Amen. Uh, But the problem that I see uh, too often is that um, people are lowering the bar, if you will. Lowering the bar, lowering the bar. Um, What I mean by this, we've all, how many people have played limbo in their life, right? That crazy guy in there. I couldn't do it right now. My back's been out for a week. And I'm just now straight enough to walk. I've been just way crooked walking around like this. For the last five days, but I'm good now. I'm here, and I'm praising God for that. Um, I couldn't play limbo today for sure, but I've tried back in the day. Woo, you know what I'm talking about, right? Uh, and and but sometimes in our in our Christian churches, uh, we're lowering the bar. We're lowering the bar. What I mean by that is, I see uh, on on social media, I see pastors um, posting pictures. Uh, of, of them drinking at, at a bar, smoking a cigar, and hey, look at me, I'm having fun at my little organic uh, beer joint, and you know what the world is saying? Oh, there's the drunk pastor. That's what they're saying. Because they, they, they don't, they, listen, the Bible would teach you that having a drink isn't bad, okay? But that's the Bible teaching, We have the mind of Christ to understand that. But the people we're trying to reach don't. And so when they see someone with a drink, what's their immediate uh, assumption? One of ten. And they're online posting pictures of them drinking and smoking. Do you want your kids doing that? Who would want their kids doing this? And, and church ministry teams posting pictures of, 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 of people uh, posing like gangsters, gangsters with fake guns and, and, and cigarettes. And like, what is that? And, 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 and churches, the, the, vulgar language. Oh, but pastor, I didn't, I didn't say it. No, you shared someone else's vulgar language, so that's okay. I get that. I get it all the time. I wasn't mine. I shared it. And, and, and churches and people and their, their posts, church posts and non-church posts, they're not supposed to be the same. They're supposed to be different, right? They're supposed to be different. Um, 1 Timothy 4.10. I'm just going to go there. Keep your place. This is what Paul says to Timothy. Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Like how you live it and what you're believing and sharing, right? Amen. We're big mouths. We're Christians. We want to tell everyone what they're doing wrong. So we want to be teaching, right? We want to teach them, but we don't care. we're not careful about how we live. 
And he says, be careful about how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right. Now listen, for the sake of your salvation. And Jesus never, look at your neighbor and say, never, never lowers the bar. And God's word says, for the sake of your own salvation, there's things that you do that are warring against Jesus' work in your life. Do you understand that? And what's scarier is that it goes on to say, not only your salvation, but the salvation of others. That you can do something that could cause someone to spend an eternity, I'm not hiding it, in a rip-roaring, God-separated, scalding, hot, torturous hell forever because of what you did. I'm not afraid to say the truth. We need tough conversations in church, Amen. right? Amen. And, and, and so God says through his word here, be careful what you do for the sake of the salvation of others. God's plan to redeem a lost and hurting world is through you. You're the ambassador of Christ. You may be the only Jesus that someone would see. Before their last breath, they may never get a copy of God's word. They may get a copy of God's word in the form of Lori, in the form of Mary, in the form of Dan. That's what they may get. You may be their Bible. And so you have to be careful about how we live, but churches are lowering their bar and lowering their bar. And churches and Christians should be open and welcoming, right? I hope you all felt that when you walked in. I hope you all felt that this is an open place of love and acceptance, right? But we're not to be conforming to those and that that we welcome in. Actually, the exact opposite is supposed to be happening. Romans 8, 29, God's word says that God has chosen us to become like his son. We're not to be conformed into the image of the world. The world is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Right? You see the difference. That's what's supposed to be happening. Romans 12, 2 says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. Okay, so let's just stop there for a second. There's a bunch of, there's seven billion people out there doing their thing. You're in it, you watch it, you hear it, you see it on the phone. The general um, perspective of the human race, you see how we just kind of live. And God's word says, don't do that. So we could get super spiritual, and I can give you Greek definitions, but how about this? See what everyone else is doing and stop. Just stop, right? Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person. What's the new person? He's just said it. Into the image of his son. Less of you, more of Jesus. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. When people see you, they should see sandals and a robe. Amen. Amen. That's what they should see. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. And that's what you're here to do tonight. For God to download into you a new way to think so that you'll have a new way to live. That's the process. If you're open to having a new way to think, say amen. 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 Awesome. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Do you think you're like everyone else? That's what you'll be. If you think you're like Jesus and you're thinking like Jesus, you'll become like Jesus. What a man thinks he is. That's it, right? Powerful. <clears throat> how many people have ever heard of this thing called the Ten Commandments? Amen. How many times, how many, we got some Bible scholars in the room. How many, how many times is the Ten Commandments listed in the scripture? Isn't it twice? Isn't it Deuteronomy and Exodus? It's repeated, right? Two times. Two times. The Ten Commandments. And everyone always talks about those. Those are the biggies, right? Those are the biggies. You got to do the Ten Commandments. That's the big ones, right? Two times. You know the scripture says to be holy for I am holy? Guess how many times that's repeated? Eight. So if the Ten Commandments are super huge and important and you should keep them and it's repeated twice, how do you think God feels about us being holy when it's repeated eight times in Scripture? It's important, isn't it? Yeah. Five times. 
in Leviticus, once in Deuteronomy, two times in 1 Peter. Be holy, for I am holy. What's that mean? It means set apart. It means different. It means be like Jesus. That means singular in purpose. That's why, what did Jesus come for? To accomplish this mission, to come to the earth and save you and build this kingdom. That's it, that's what he's here for. There was nothing else. He wasn't here to be nice to you. He was here to establish his kingdom. And if you're to be holy as he is holy, if he came to establish a kingdom, what's your only purpose on this earth? Let me hear it loud and proud. Establish the kingdom of God. And that's it. Be holy for I am holy. Can I read some of those to you? I want to read two of them to you. Let me read uh, 1 Peter 1.15. 1 Peter 1.15 says, uh, this, this is an individual call. This is to you. Raise your hand if you're a you. Yeah, that's you. You, okay. You individually, right? This is, this is just for you. 1 Peter 1.14 says, so you must live as God's obedient children. How much, I'm just curious how much wiggle room's in that? None. None. Um, you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways, right? Don't, 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 don't do it. If you used to do this, don't do it anymore. That's it. This, I love Revolution Church. It's simple theology. Don't do that. Right? What do you tell your kids when they're going over sticking a paper clip in the exhaust? Do you go explain to them AC and DC and amps and, and wattage? What do you do? Don't do that! Right? That's what a loving parent sounds like. And that's what God, your father, is sounding like. Don't do that! Right? It's going to hurt you. First, first Peter 1.14, so you must... Live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old waves. Living to satisfy your own desires. That's, we could preach a month on that half a sentence. He says, you didn't know any better then. Like when you were, before you were saved and you're like everyone else, that's why you were doing everything that everyone else did, right? You didn't know any better, right? I didn't know any better. I, I did what I thought everyone, I was supposed to do. Everyone was getting drunk, so what do I do? I didn't, who, like, literally, some of them you will say yes, but how many people literally, like, like the flavor of a cigarette? It's like eating dirt, right? Some people kind of, okay, but, but generally speaking, but why do we do it? Why do we start? Because everyone else is doing it, right? And he's saying, don't do what everybody else says. Don't do what everybody else does, right? He says, you didn't know any better then, and... Say, I didn't, I didn't, but now, but now, see, but now, why? But, but Jesus went to the cross, and Jesus gave you new life, and Jesus gave you the Holy Spirit, and Jesus gave you his mind, and Jesus gave you the keys to the kingdom, so you're different, so, but now, you must be holy in, what, in what? Everything you do. Just as God who chose you. Doesn't that feel good? Yes. He chose you. He chose you. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. you didn't choose him. The Bible says that nobody is seeking God. Down with seeker-sensitive churches and up with churches that preach God's word. Yes. Right? God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you, personal, just you, What's your name? Just say your name. I know there's more than that in this room. <laughs> How about if we all do that one time? Say your name. One, two, three, go. Yeah. He heard you. You must be holy because I am holy. That's what he says to you personally tonight. Deuteronomy 23, you can go all the way back into the, into the Old Testament. We'll go old school. Deuteronomy chapter 23. I can say it right now. I'm not in a rush tonight, so. I didn't preach last week. You're hurting now. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Tom, if you're watching. Privileged and honored to have you as part of our family here. 
What a wonderful man of God, isn't he? Awesome, awesome. What a, just a great dad. <clears throat> not that you're older than me. Not ripping on you, man. I just, I almost called him daddy the other day. <laughs> he was just giving me good advice, man. Thank, I just want to be like, thanks, dad. <clears throat> it's awesome. I love you, Tom. So, so, so that First Peter one fifteen, that's to you, right? You, okay. But, 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 but you, according to the scriptures, have been placed into the body of Christ according to His good pleasure. So you're not here by mistake tonight. You're here because He drew you here by His Spirit, right? It's it, this was His call. It was His call. You might not have felt that tractor beam pulling you, but you had one on you. And he pulled you in here tonight to talk to you. And so, not just the call for the individual to be holy, but now, corporately, right here, the Revolution Church family of which you are part of. This is what it says. The camp must be holy. For the Lord your God moves around in your camp. Do you feel him moving around? I feel him moving around in here all the time. He's here. This is our camp. It's our camp right here. The camp must be holy for the Lord your God moves around in your camp to protect you and to defeat your enemies. You must not see any shameful thing among you or he will, this is, this is harsh, or he will turn away from you. Read Revelation. And Jesus is clear. There's a way I want you to conduct yourself, church. And if you don't, I'm out of here. Here's another warning. Let there be no shameful thing among us. This is the time, and not planned, but I think right, that we just get quiet for a minute because now is the time you need to repent of sin. Because what you do affects me and what I do affects you. Because we're all in this camp right here together, Amen. right? And if this thing's gonna work, we can't have shameful junk in our camp or else he doesn't defend and he doesn't protect and he doesn't, he doesn't hang out here. I want him here. <laughs> Why? What, what makes us distinct amongst all other people is that God goes with us. If he doesn't go with us, we don't wanna go at all, Right? So, so we need to take a second. I, I just, I just, I want you to do that because that's where the process starts. You repent to him, Amen. right? And then if some, if, if, if this, if this thing that you're repenting of is because you did something to someone in this room, you need to get off your hiney and you need to go make contact with that person and say you're sorry. Amen. So take a second and listen, let's put your head down. Put your head down. Don't look at anybody because you're going to make them feel uncomfortable if you do. Just put your head down. Give people the freedom to be able to move around if they need to. months ago some of the people in the church here that I love that you know we like to mess around can't have stuffy church I'm so not about that right that's lame if you want a lame church go somewhere else so we have fun we rip on each other we have fun and so a couple of the people in the in the band especially because they're all nuts and they they sent this this video over to me that that I was to watch and it was called the swag seminary and so is the, you'll see it. It's about, this, it's about the church where all the, you know, the pastors have to be all cool because that's, what, that's, that's what's going to work. So I want you to kind of check out this video if you, if you don't mind. It's only a few minutes. My name's it's Doug. Pretty, but pay I'm attention. I'm a pastor from Oklahoma. I don't know. My sermons and illustrations, they're just not really connecting these days. So I tried everything. Books, prayer, books on prayer, fasting. Nothing's really working. 
We grew up in church. We've just seen over time pastors just kind of become outdated. We wanted to create a program to help pastors kind of become more relevant. Yeah, help extend their reach. Just, you know, build their platform a little. Throw a little juju on their beat. Doug, how you doing, sir? I'm okay. What can we do for you? Well, things have been kind of rough for me the past few months. Yeah, church not going well, huh? No, no. Attendance is flat. Tithing's low. I'm not really connecting with my congregation. Well, Doug, boot cut khakis. That's not helping anything. Did you guys do a mannequin challenge at your church? Running man challenge. Pokemon Go series. Crying Jordan jokes. Also, we knew you were coming in. We took a look at some of your sermon series. You had one recently called uh, The Parables of Jesus. Oh, I'm bored. <laughs> Already, we just optioned a sermon series called Screenshotted if Jesus had a Snapchat. We did. It helped literally no one, but he got so many followers from it. You ever heard of Netflix and chill? Netflix and God's will. What about Walking Dead? The Walking Bread. <laughs> Boom. Uh, I don't know, Finding Dory. Finding Glory? You got it, Doug. You're on it. So you just take mainstream titles and you make them Christian. Is that even legal? Hey, little phrase we like to say around here, trust the process. You know what's back now these days? A uh, little series, you might have heard of it, Gilmore Girls. We already wrote a book called Fulfillmore Fulfill Girls. Girls. Yeah, what do you think about that? I don't understand why you would imitate a culture that we're supposed to be against. Let's hop on your social media. Let's, Let's take a look at that. There's a lot of things we can improve there. Doug, look, you posted an Instagram at a Kroger, okay? Oh, bad news, Doug. You don't shop at Kroger anymore, okay? Whole Foods and Trader Joe's is where you're gonna live. Outdoor farmer's markets photos do so well for your new brand. Doug, we gotta hook you up with a personal trainer. Are you a member of a gym? It's real simple, okay? What we start with is the non-denominational multivitamin. That's just gonna give you a little bit more pep in your step, a little bit more energy on Sunday mornings. If you wanna go a step up from there, we have the Grow Shell Gummies. What that's gonna do for you is give a little more tone in the shoulders, make those sweaters fit a little tighter. Now, if you wanna go all the way, Furtick food. I don't know, guys, I just wanna preach. And you will, but first, hair and makeup. Doug, you're wearing a polo shirt tucked into your khakis. Are you speaking at a golf pro shop? Tiger Woods, you not? I'm gonna untuck it for you. We're gonna start there. Okay. First of all, the length of the shirt is a problem, okay? Here's what we're gonna do. You see this line right here? That's a swag pastor state. We call it the straight and narrow. We did it. I, I just rededicated my life. You look amazing. <gasps> Let's head over to your church. We got work to do. We'll swag out that sanctuary, add a wood pallet background. We'll have you plant satellite campuses in no time. Yeah. <laughs> so, super funny, but why are, we, why are we copying a culture that we're supposed to be against? Right? We're the ecclesia, we're the called out people. Revolution Church, we're supposed to be creating a new culture and bringing that to the world. Amen. Not taking that and bringing it in here and posting pictures of us getting drinking and, and gangster shots with guns and cigarettes and copying the culture of our world. That's not what we're supposed to be doing at all. And I believe in an effort to be effective and to grow their church. Many churches have chosen a lowered bar so everyone would feel welcomed and everyone would feel like there's easy access rather than preaching truth with passion and promoting purity of heart and holiness. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And Jesus never, ever lowered the bar. And, and here's the scary thing, and this should scare you, right? This is not... Uh, oh, it's a reverent fear of God. No, no. This is to scare you that on judgment day, which we're all headed for, that many will say, Lord, Lord, they'll be calling out to Jesus and he'll look over at you and say, who are you? I never knew you. Listen, get away from me. Deceived. We'll talk about that. But a massive 
huge, full church doesn't always mean that they're all authentic Christ followers. I mean, we haven't read our text yet, but would you do me a favor? Look at the beginning of our text here in, in chapter 14, verse 25. What's it even say? A large crowd was following Jesus, and he turns around and he says some things. And what we're going to read here in a minute is he looks at a huge crowd, right? Who wants their church to be big? I would love our church to be, this is exciting. I would love to see, you know, 20,000 people in our church, but they got to all be loving and, and, and serving the Lord. It's nothing wrong with a big church, but he looks at this big church, if you will, this big crowd of people, and what you're going to hear is he gives three really high bars, and no doubt whittling away at this crowd, telling them things that's not just, hey, you got to believe who I am. No, he's like, here's some things that you got to understand and embrace and believe and live out in order to be a real follower of Christ. And so he looks at a huge crowd, a huge church, and he doesn't say, oh, this is awesome. Let's just tell them what they want to hear. No, no, no. Some of you aren't getting it. Some of you aren't getting it. And he starts to unload what they're not getting. Watered down, wide open Christianity is not Christianity at all. Love tells the truth. And love screams, imminent danger ahead. Stop, you're going to crash. That's what love does. Amen. And I'm warning you. Matthew 7, 13 in the English Standard Version says, Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. <clears throat> the way is easy. If it seems like becoming a Christian seems super easy, maybe you're not. The, the way to destruction is wide and it's easy. Okay, being a Christian is not easy. Do you understand? It's not easy. And it says those who enter the wide gate to destruction that are taking it easy are many. Are many. Following Jesus is not easy. And love is warning you. And love is exhorting you tonight. And it was love that inspires James to exhort his reader in his book, in chapter 1, verse 22, where he says, Be doers, not just hearers of God's word, or else you deceive yourself. Do you know that God's never deceived? Do you understand? Do you understand that never, ever in all of eternity will someone walk strolling into heaven and he goes to his angels, hey, I didn't know he was getting in. I thought he didn't do what he was supposed to do to get here. No, no one's, he, was, he will never be deceived. But there's many of us that are deceived because we think something that we're not. Because we believed something that we don't live. And his standard is high. He does not lower the bar ever. There's lots of deceived people. And don't be thinking about your neighbor. And Jesus on the heels, this was not last week, I wasn't here with you, but the week before, where he says to the people, listen, the kingdom of God is not just sometime in the future, it's here now. And I want my father's house full now. This is getting there, I like that. It's good, it's good. Some of you brought people that says we're supposed to bring people to the Lord. Some of you brought people to the Lord tonight. You should be commended for being obedient to God's word. You brought people to the Lord. It's awesome. And so on the heels of that, he lets his disciples and us know with clarity that being part of the kingdom of God is more than just, yeah, I believe it. So let's read. Luke 14 Verse 25, I'm going to read through 33. Are you with me? Okay. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else. Your father, then he explains, because we make excuses, right? We go, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. He's like, yeah, no, no, but everyone else, including 
but not limited to, <laughs> right? Your father, your mother, your wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't win, he'll send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. So I just jotted down a couple things. If you take notes, please jot this down. Becoming an authentic follower of Christ is not just believing. Um, it's a priority change. You'll see it there in verse 25 through 27. Just going to read it again to reiterate. Jesus looks at the crowd and he says, if, if you want to be my disciple, you must by comparison hate everyone else, your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. Your priorities, look at someone, put your hand on their shoulder, show them that you love them, and say, must change. Your priorities must change. Listen, there's no waiver, there's no exceptions, there's no leniency. Your priorities must change. And Jesus Christ, for the sake of clarity, goes after the number one thing on your priority list so that you can renumber it. He goes after your life and your own family. Because here on earth, that should be the most important thing to you. And Jesus, to make sure he's clear so you understand, he goes after the best thing, the highest thing, the most important thing, and makes it known that I am now number one. I'm renumbering your list if you want to follow me. Amen. And if your priorities shift to Jesus and to his word and his mission and his church and his kingdom, then your life will reflect the shift. Listen, <laughs> we need to have some honesty in church right now. Okay, I'm going to show you some pictures here in a second. And I, listen, I don't need, nobody needs any religious platitudes of, well, this guy might be, and you don't know his heart. Okay, let's just pretend that you're alone and you don't need to prove anything to anybody. Okay, I got a question for you before we show a picture. Hypothetical. Let's just say next Saturday night at six o'clock, there's a Florida State football game on TV, right? Now, okay, right? So let me ask you a question. Who's most likely to blow that game off? This guy? Show the next one. That's painted guy, right? Is he, okay? There's that guy. And then, and then here's the next guy, glitter guy, right? This guy, they're morons. We could call them moron guys. And don't say because they have the wrong colors on, because if they're in orange and blue, morons too. <laughs> Universal hatred of anything that comes in opposition to the kingdom of God. I'm all about ripping it down. Okay? What are these guys? Listen, I understand they're not, we don't know them. I'm just using this as an example. The people that have glitter all over their face, they might love the Lord Jesus like crazy. But I'm just asking you, of the three groups of people, who, who's, the, who's the, the, the group of people that are least likely to, blow, to read Hebrews 10, 25 that says, don't neglect gathering together, or, or, or Luke 14, 23 that says, I want my house full. Who do you think is most likely prone to ignoring that? Glitter guy? Or a Bible study guy. I'm just using it as an example. That's all. Just using it as an example. Your priorities have to change. 
When you're a member of the kingdom of God, glitter guy shouldn't exist like that. He shouldn't be the, that shouldn't be the biggest thing for you. I'm just doubting that they're going, you should come to church Saturday night. I don't think that's happening. Priorities need to change. Right, so here's the second thing. Priorities have to change. And, and listen, to be a Christian, there's a price. There's a price. And uh, we look at verse 28 through 30. It's not by accident that Jesus uses this verbiage. Don't begin the cost until you count the cost. Don't begin the construction until you count the cost. Being a Christian is going to cost you something. I explained to you earlier what the scripture says, that the way that does not lead to Jesus but leads to destru destruction is what? Is easy. It's not asking much of you, actually. The devil would love to have seven billion of us go, yeah, I believe in Jesus, and do nothing about it. That type of faith, if it's faith at all, which I doubt, asks nothing of you. Brother Theo, think you're getting in here without me acknowledging you? <laughs> I love you, brother. I miss you. Okay, eyes back on Jesus. You know, King David famous king, probably the most famous king to ever live. Um, super wealthy, super powerful. Do you ever notice that rich people get free stuff? Isn't that weird? I shared the story a long time ago in our church. All of you are new, so you don't know the story probably except Mary. But I used to work at the country club in Mount Dora. You guys know where that is? <clears throat> it's kind of expensive to go there and play. Cost you guys probably 50 bucks or so to go out there and play on any given season. I don't know what it is really anymore. One day we're in the pro shop and Dr. J came in. You guys remember? Who, know, who remembers Dr. J? Played basketball. All the old people, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Right. Okay. He played in the NBA. So do you think he's strapped for cash? So my buddy Sean is running the pro shop. He says, oh, he comps him. And I'm sitting there. I was working in the card barn for like six bucks an hour in tips. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me right now? This guy's a millionaire and you just let him play for free and I got to pay 50 bucks to play? How does that even work? Right? So it makes no sense. Give the poor guy a break, would you? That's the way the world thinks. But King David, who is Dr. J times a thousand, right? He says in 2 Samuel 24, 24, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God an offering that costs me nothing. See, the point that David and Jesus are making is that to truly follow Jesus means cost. It, it means um, willingly and actively uh, offering to God that which he, listen, demands of you. But doing it actively, which means now and continuous, and willingly, happily, cheerfully, because of all that he's done for you, and you realize his purpose is to change the world, you're like, what better thing could I invest in than that? What is the best thing I could do with my hour tomorrow than to see his kingdom advance? What's the best thing I could do with my 50 bucks than to see his kingdom advance? And David says, I will not bring a sacrifice of an offering to my Lord that costs me nothing to be a true follower of Christ. It's a cost. It's going to cost you something. There's a, there's a price. And so you got to ask yourself, am I willing to give up things that I hold precious for him? It's not a hypothetical question. That's a question you should be writing down and asking yourself. Yes. And am I willing to offer my resources back to the one who gave them to me? What is it that I have that I have not received? And am I willing to let the Holy Spirit change me 
by giving up my throne to Jesus Christ the Lord. Will I do that? So what's the cost that he demands? Romans 12, 2. 12, 1, I'm sorry. It says, give your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. What's that mean? Give yourself. Nothing that you are should be kept from him. Nothing. And nothing he adds to you should be kept from him. When the offering plate comes by, it shouldn't be shamed or shunned or run to the bathroom at that time. You should rush to it. Rush. If you don't want to rush to this church, rush to another one. I don't give a rip. But rush to give that which is his. He demands, listen, if you want to be a Christian, I, I want you to be a Christian. If you're not a Christian tonight, I want you to be a Christian. I'm like, I'm not hiding that. I want you to be a Christian. I want to party in heaven with you forever. But if you want to be, this is what it is. It's not like some walk in the park and sounds better than Scientology. It's not like that. This is God's word. This is the truth. Everything I am for your kingdom's cause. That's what he's looking for. <clears throat> so your priorities must change. Your price must be paid. Just for clarity, your price for forgiveness and eternity, that's been paid. Oh, I got to give you guys another chance at that. Hold on. <clears throat> your price for forgiveness and eternity has been paid. Awesome. Awesome. So that you don't pay for. I'm not going, uh, you know, indulgences here. Don't Martin Luther me and put some stuff on my office do door telling me I'm doing wrong. That, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Your, your forgiveness and your eternity has been purchased. That price is paid. But to really follow him, if you're going to be like him, be holy for I am holy, remember? Cost him, cost you. You want to be like him, it's going to cost. So priorities must change, price must be paid. And then this, uh, perseverance. Look at verse 31 and 32. You'll see it right there in the text. I'm not making anything up, it's just right there. Um, first he talks about the family, then he talks about counting the cost of construction, using all these examples. Talks about a king, he says, what king goes to war? against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss whether his army of 10,000 could feed the 20,000 soldiers marching against him. War is attrition, right? War, war, war back, when he's talking about kings and soldiers, he's not talking about now when, when, when we're mad at someone and we want to get an ISIS guy, we put some coordinates into a computer, press a button, and it goes 10,000 miles across the earth and lands on his lap. That, no, that's not what he was talking about, right? They didn't have that yet. What'd they have? We go out to the field, right? You bring your guys and I bring mine. Let's do this, right? And they start slinging swords and they start whacking each other and killing each other, and they do it until someone's dead. And if your guys are still standing, you win. That's what war is. It's attrition. How long will you last? How long will you last? Will you see this thing through? Being a Christ follower, your priorities change, your price must be paid, and seeing it through to its conclusion is what it's all about. How about a couple of verses about that? You want some Bible verses? Yes. How about Matthew 24, 13? But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. How about Hebrews 3, 14? For, we, for if, say if, yes. if we are faithful to the end, trusting God just as firmly as when we first believed, we will share in all that belongs to Christ. You want one more? 1 John 2, 24. So you must Remain faithful to what you have been taught from the beginning. Seeing it through to its conclusion. Can I tough this thing out, this Christian thing? 
This commitment to the Lord thing. Can I, will I hold on to Jesus no matter the battle, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance, will I hold? Will I last to the end? Will I persevere? 1 Peter 1, 7. Just listen. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith, listen, when, so when your faith remains strong through many trials, I'm just seeing perseverance all through that, right? Don't you see it? When, you're, when, you're, when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ Jesus is revealed to the whole world. The authentic follower of Christ, their priorities shift. The price is to be paid. It's going to cost you. And we must persevere to the very end. Um, Look back in the text, back in Luke 14, and you'll see kind of like a, a summary of all of he has, what he has said here in this section of Scripture. He kind of wraps it up here in verse 33, and Jesus says, this is, I mean, this is just an amazing, talk about not lowering your bar. You ready for this? I mean, we're, we're lowering the bar. Listen, you can, you can come to church and you can be a Christian. You can be, you can be, a, a, you can be a pastor and, and you can break them all, all the rules. I don't, we don't care. Just make sure you show up to sweep the joint. And you can, you can sin and you can break God's law and you can be an affront to the Holy Spirit. You could do that. Just come. It's all good. Listen, we, can, we need to let everyone come. But we're not to be conformed into that. They're to be conformed into this, right? And so, so here's the bar that he sets. He says, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Who would ever be happy with that? Not me. I'll be the first to say I'm not happy with that. So you gotta, you gotta dig deeper because if you read that, you're like, yeah, I don't want, that religion sucks. I don't want to do that one, right? Why would I want to? I want a God that's going to prosper me and give me health and rich and, you know, give away every. <clears throat> so, for my brothers, Jonathan and Herb, I will tell you that the word that's actually used in the King James version. Can I get an amen? amen. Okay, <laughs> it says. Giving up everything is forsaketh. Forsaketh. Do you know that the, this idea of forsaking is used countless times in Scripture? Countless times. But this word right here, this specific one in verse 33, is used one time in the entire Bible. And it means to renounce, to bid farewell. I love that. See ya. To leave behind, to send away, to depart, to dismiss. Luke uh, 17.33 gives us some indication what this means. If you cling to your life, you lose it. If you let your life go, you save it. So the, the point that Jesus is saying here is, is, and if you study the scriptures, and that's why we're a Bible church, because we want to get the fullness of, the, of what the God's word would say. It says in the scriptures that I'm the Lord God who teaches thee to profit. So it's not like he doesn't want you to be blessed. He might want you to actually be rich too. I, I don't know. I mean, that's up to him. Some people get it. Some people don't. That's his decision. All good things come from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. That's his decision, right? He tells us to work hard so we could gain material wealth to provide for our families. Like it's in there, right? So it's not like he really wants you to give away. Everything's got to mean something. He's gotta, it's got to mean something. What it means is like, are you willing? Are you willing to take everything that you have and put it in its proper place? Your wife, your husband, your children, your job, your church, your pastor, your best friends, your money, your time, everything. Are you willing to just say, 
Shalom. I'm going with Jesus. Peter gives us the greatest example of this. When he sees Jesus and he meets Jesus, the guy's a fisherman, right? What does he do? It says in the scriptures he got up, left everything, and followed Christ. I am so happy that I can engage Gabe in that way. You're the, you, you're the best preacher ever. <laughs> I love you, Gabe. So, <laughs> I love you, dude. I love you, dude. So, so Peter, right, he's a fisherman, right? So he leave, like that was his job, right? He was fishing. Is that his job now? No, he's fishing. He, he's, he's evangelizing. He's going to spread the, the good news of Jesus. That's his new job. He's going to give up his job. He had to give up, look, he's a fisherman, right? Anyone in here fish? Who's a fisherman here? Right? So don't you know that, I mean, I'm not a fisherman, but I know that you're supposed to like fish maybe early mornings, late afternoons, because during the day when it's like super hot, they ain't biting, right? You didn't, there's certain schedules that a fisherman would be on. And if you're not a fisherman, but you have a job, you have a schedule that you're on, right? And Peter, no doubt, had a schedule that he was on. That ain't a schedule no more. When Jesus got up and started walking, Peter got up and started walking. When Jesus stopped and sat down, Peter sat down. He was willing to give up his job, willing to give up his schedule, willing to give up his home, his family. He had to get new friends, old motives, old priorities, old language and behavior and strategies and habits and patterns. Oh, I always do this. No, not anymore. This is what I, no, not anymore. This is the way I was made. No. You were made in my image to be like me. So if you're not doing this way, then the way you did it was wrong. Start thinking differently about this. One of the greatest things that my brother Dan, John, I don't know, he ran off here. Dan said that there was a day in his life that he realized, this is crazy, right? That he realized that everything he thought was wrong. Everything that he thought was wrong. He started questioning whether that the couch that he was sitting on was even a couch. That's how bad it was. You have to start, you have to get to that place where all your thinking and what you think is right, you realize it's wrong. I, my wife and I were, were listening to the sermon series, we're working through it right now, and he said this, this was a hammer. He said, your life is a wreck. And this, that you're in presently right now, is the result of your best thinking. Time to change the way you think. And it's time for the church to change the way we think and act. Because people's salvation is at stake. And Jesus and his purposes must become priority one on your list. So listen, I want to call the, the band. As the band comes back up, they're going to give us an opportunity right now to, to worship Jesus Christ, okay? We're going to worship Jesus Christ. We're going to, you know what that means? That means we're going to lower down every other thing on this planet and exalt one, Jesus Christ. And this reminds you as they come up here that accomplishing his purposes in your life is going to cost you. It's going to cost you your time. It's going to cost you your money. You're going to have to serve him. You're going to have to work for him. And, and, and in an authentic Christ follower, eyes up, eyes up, an authentic Christ follower has within them a willingness to give up of these resources with joy. That's what we're shooting for. There's no sugarcoating or watering down the truth of authentic discipleship. Being an authentic disciple of Jesus Christ always means a momentous shift, a monumental shift in your personal status quo. And that's what Revolution Church is all about. It's a group of individuals who have had a shift in their personal status quo. So together, corporately, we are having a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. 
Because this is a place where Jesus Christ is exalted because the truth of his word is proclaimed. That's my job. But you're not off the hook. This place is a revolution because it's a place where Jesus is exalted because the people who hear God's word desire to obey it. That's your part. And it's a shift in the status quo because it's a place where Jesus is exalted because the narrow gate to glory is paved with God's word and it's the only way to worship God correctly. Amen. And our priorities must shift. It's going to cost a lot and our commitment is for an eternity. And that's an authentic Christ follower. And I ask you, is that who you are? Let's pray. Let's pray that it is. Let's pray that it is. God, I thank you that you are here with us. I thank you, Lord, for your clear word of love and exhortation. Normally, Lord, when we pray, I stress the importance of that this prayer is between me and you and the individual and you. But I want to ask you to do something in addition to that now. That you would expand our heart's capacity to love, to pray for those around us that we know. That they would also know the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what you call us to and what you demand of us to be an authentic follower of Jesus, to be a true disciple, one whose name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. Give us the boldness to, to share the, the, the good news, the, the word of God with, of truth. Help us never to sugarcoat it, never to water it down, never to lower the bar, and trust that you will build your church with the proclamation of truth. Help us not to be of this world, not to be exactly like them, but to love them, to welcome them, to pray for them, to care for them, to provide for them, but not to conform to them. Those of us that you've chosen, which in my theological perspective is everyone, chosen everyone to worship you. You're the one true God. Of course you've chosen everyone to worship you. So that's whom we should love. And that's who we should tell the truth to. And I thank you that tonight you told the truth to everyone in this room. Now Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, take the clear word that has been shared tonight and burn it into our heart that we might live what we have heard no longer phoning it in but living out what we have heard for our blessing and your kingdom in Jesus name keep your heads down keep your heads down if God's word has, if God has spoken to you tonight and you heard his voice personally, please raise your hand and leave it up. If you need evidence, listen, keep your hand up. If you need evidence that the God you're going to sing to right now is real, open your eyes and look. He's alive. Amen. He's alive. Stand up and let's sing to our risen King.